history. I'm a full-time faculty who teach history. Um, I was talking to uh, Raphael a few minutes ago, and it turns out I think this is the ninth year that we've had uh, Constitution Day activities. Uh, by way of um, explanation, uh, Congress several years ago um, passed legislation requiring institutions that receive public funding to have a day that is dedicated to the understanding of the Constitution. Now, the Constitution of the United States was ratified in September of 1787 um, by, by the, by the, by the, uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention that met in Philadelphia. Uh, we have never been able to pull off doing it on the actual day that the Constitution was ratified because the founding fathers took no notice of the academic year. And the academic year begins in September, okay? And we all come back and it's just too soon to pull something together. But, you know, I think Congress appreciates that we're honoring the spirit of that. Um, this year the topic is going to be um, uh, war powers and the Constitution. The Constitution says about the power to make war, how that power has been interpreted through history. Um, and uh, we're going to, uh, and it seems particularly relevant to do so this year because at the time we were planning this, uh, there was great debate over the nature of the, uh, what could be the nature of the United States response to uh, the Syrian government's apparent use of chemical gas on its own citizens. Um, we're going to approach the issue from three different areas. Rafael Fierro will speak first. He's going to deal with the um, sort of an overview and talk about some of the resolutions that Congress has passed. Um, in order to authorize presidential action without actually going to the, to, to the step of declaring formal war. Um, Fran Cohn, Francis Cohn, Dr. Cohn, is going to speak about um, a specific piece of legislation, the War Powers Act of 1973. And then I'm going to conclude by speaking about the many, 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 many cases of undeclared war in which the United States has engaged since its founding. Um, that, um, I guess, can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay. Thanks for being here. I wasn't expecting this huge turnout. I don't know that we've ever had as many people as we do today, so that's awesome. You know, I was walking through the library yesterday and I was checking out some of the educational DVDs and one of them I came across was Bush's War, that was the name of it, in reference to the Iraq War. And, you know, I had my thesis for this established already, but it confirmed what I was going to say today, and that is that whenever there's a war and it doesn't go well, it's the president who gets blamed. And there is some justification for that. But I think much less attention gets paid to the behavior of Congress. So what I'd like to do is put Congress under a microscope today and examine their actions when it comes to war. Uh, for me, the Constitution is very clear that the power to declare war clearly belongs to the legislative branch, if it would only keep that power. Too often it's relinquished it. And then blame the president even though it has justified war in its own way. The president doesn't have the power to declare war unless the nation is being attacked. Then I think one person has to make a snap decision as to what to do when that falls to the president. The president has the power to wage war otherwise. And logic dictates that you have to declare a war before you can wage one. So the framers, if you look at their words, in the text of the Constitution and, and beyond that, and they meant for the legislative and executive branches to work together when it comes time for going to war. But they wanted the legislative branch to take the lead. And the Constitution itself speaks to that. Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the power to declare war, states it right there. Uh, Congress also has the, po the power to raise and support armies, provide and maintain a navy. It has powers to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. That's all in Article 1, Section 8. There's a lot there contained in that one section. Article 1, Section 7. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives with the Senate proposing and concurring. So it obviously costs money to wage war 
the longer the war, the more money it costs. And it's only Congress that, that can allocate the funds to do that. Now, the president's power is equally clear, I would say. First of all, it's instructive that Article 2, which lists the president's power, comes before, comes after Article 1. The founding fathers meant for the legislative branch to take the initiative. That's why it placed it first, with many more responsibilities than the president. But more clearly than that, Article 2, Section 2, the president shall be commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. Uh, and also commander of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. Now, who calls them into service? Congress by declaring war. So once again, it gets back to that initial function that precedes waging a war. It's been also argued that in Article 2, Section 1, so-called vesting clause, the president has broad power to conduct foreign affairs, but that doesn't give him the power to declare war, just to conduct now, beyond the actual words of the Constitution, the founders were clear on who has the power to declare a war in their correspondence with each other, in their private letters, and also in their uh, official publications. James Madison said to Thomas Jefferson, quote, the Constitution supposes what the history of all governments demonstrates, that the executive is the branch of power most interested in war. And that's probably true. I think the history of the last 60 years has demonstrated that for the United States. And the executive is more prone to war. It has accordingly, with studied care, vested the question of war in the legislature. Alexander Hamilton, who was often invoked as the framer, who wanted an energetic, vibrant president, who wanted to take action. In Federalist 69, he wrote, the president's power in substance is inferior to that of a king. He's not to act like a king in that he cannot declare war. Only the legislature can do that. Hamilton also said that the president would have the direction of war when authorized or begun. So once again, he's reaffirming the fact that the president can wage war, not declare war. Now, much has been made in, in recent years, especially of the idea that presidents have grabbed power from Congress. And those presidents, they just can't stop abusing their power. Again, to some extent, that is true. But it is my opinion, based on my studying of human nature, that if you give someone power, he's going to take it, regardless of how nice of a person he is or how much he's willing to go to war or not. It's human nature. Okay. So the president gets blamed for war, for a war being fought, especially when it becomes an unpopular war. And for that, he has been labeled an imperial president. Those are the words of Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., a famous historian, who made the case that after World War II, a president, in terms of foreign policy, has acted more like a king than a president. He usurps power. Uh, members of Congress have joined in recently by calling uh, a drawn-out conflict the President's War. During the Vietnam War, it became dubbed Johnson's War. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was the president who initially carried out America's military intervention in Vietnam beginning in 1964-65. After Johnson, it was called Nixon's War because he continued it until he was forced to resign in 1974. Iraq has been called Bush's War, the name of the video I saw in the library yesterday. Ted Kennedy decided to kind of combine those two wars. He's called Iraq War Bush's Vietnam. I've never seen a title, or I've never heard someone speak in terms of it being Congress's war. Political scientist Michael Haas has called Bush a war criminal for his role in the Iraq War. He's actually listed about 269 war crimes that the former president has committed. Now, I'm not here to debate whether George Bush was a good president and whether he committed war crimes or not, but I think that the fact that the focus is always on the president when it comes to war. It's a little misleading. In fact, Congress bears the main responsibility for war. Only Congress has the power of the purse to allocate money, as we've seen. Since World War II, Congress has not given the president one declaration of war, even though the United States has been involved in six major conflicts since 1945 and many 
smaller military operations. In these wars, it is not the case that the president simply grabs power from Congress. In fact, Congress willingly gives him the power. In each of these wars, if you look at Vietnam or Iraq, Afghanistan, for good measure, they've been popular at the outset. And they've remained popular longer than most people think. The Vietnam War did not become unpopular until about 1969. That's when a majority of Americans started to turn against the war. Prior to that, Congress fully supported it, with only a couple of exceptions. And they continued to give the president money to fund the war. It's not until the war went sour in the minds and hearts of the American people that Congress began lashing out at the president. So Congress has often given the president a blank check to fight a war indefinitely, and then turned on him when the war became less popular. More than that, Congress, while not officially declaring war, has given the president the authority to use force and has used elusive language in its resolutions to protect itself. Two examples, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution of 1964, that's what drew America into the Vietnam War and the authorization for use of military force against Iraq. That resolution of 2002, of course, provoked a 10, 11-year war in Iraq. Let's look at the Gulf of Tonkin resolution first, August 1964. Uh, there's a quote from it. This is the actual language of Congress. Congress approves and supports the determination of the president as commander-in-chief to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. Uh, that's a very vague resolution. It can mean whatever the president wants it to mean. And you always have to be wary of political leaders making for vague resolutions, vague laws, because the person with the power in the end can shape those laws and those resolutions the way he wants. In the authorization to use force in Iraq, uh, that resolution refers to members of al-Qaeda, an organization bearing responsibility for attacks on the United States, its citizens, and interests, including the attacks that occurred on September 11. So Congress is actually conflating September 11 with the war in Iraq. It wasn't the president who initially did that. It continues, Iraq has aided and harbored other international terrorist organizations, including organizations that threaten the lives of the American people. The resolution also mentions the threat posed by Iraq regarding weapons of mass destruction, which is the criticism leveled against the president, President Bush, that he was the one who made up this fabrication. In fact, it was Congress that received similar information and wrote it down in, in their resolution. So the president is authorized to use the armed forces of the United States as he determines to be necessary and appropriate. That's the ending of that resolution. Once again, giving the president basically a blank check to do as he pleases. The next thing you know, you have a decades-long war. So Congress included in this language the very arguments that they dismissed later as reasons for going to war in Iraq. So to me, it's imperative to remember that a president cannot abuse power in this regard without Congress's permission. As the situation in Syria unfolds, and it seems to have quieted down for a while now that the Russians have come up with this deal to take those chemical weapons away from the Syrian government, but that situation is probably not going to go away anytime soon. We'll see a reemergence of potential U.S. military intervention there. The familiar cries against the president, in this case President Obama, of a power-hungry executive, uh, I think is very misleading. There's a quotation here from David Adler of the Idaho Statesman. He said, here we go again. Reports that the Obama, um, Obama administration is planning, without congressional authorization, a military strike against Syria represents a grim reminder of the fact that presidential usurpation of power by Republicans and Democrats alike has become a grotesque fixture in the life of America. Well, President Obama has demonstrated a willingness to actually discuss the matter of Syria with Congress. He actually wanted Congress to, to give him some feedback, much to his credit, I would say. But he's also indicated that he does not need congressional approval for military operations. So I'm not sure where he stands right now. It's rather ambiguous. 
But we must remember in any case that Congress has the power to simply say no to the president by first not authorizing force and then by not funding. Okay. In history, Congress has had many opportunities to reject the president's continuation of the war, and it seldom um, acts on that. One final note, Congress represents the pulse of the people. It doesn't just have the power of the purse, it represents the pulse of the people. And this is why it is necessary for Americans to be attuned to what's actually going on. If people want war, Congress will give it to them through the president um, and his power to wage it. If people do not, Congress might return to doing its job under the Constitution. Thank you. circumstances can the President of the United States employ American military forces absent a congressional declaration of war? And that's the big gray area in the Constitution. There, there, there's no prohibition exactly put in the Constitution about the President doing that. So the question is, can a President do that? Can a President deploy U.S. military forces into combat or potential combat situations without a congressional declaration of war? I'm going to specifically look at, for a few minutes here, the War Powers Act, which was passed in 1973, and give you a little bit of background on history. Certainly, this was an act that grew out of the Vietnam era, specifically, and Dr. Fierro has already referred to that. In a sense, it was a response, or really, in a sense, maybe a correction to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. People in Congress believing that because of the way the war went, and the war didn't go well, that perhaps they had granted a series of presidents too much latitude in waging policy. So they, they wanted to kind of reel that back in. <coughs> so first and foremost, and I'll look at the details of the act in, in a couple of minutes here. First and foremost, then, this law or resolution was passed as a reaction to Vietnam. The manner in which the United States got involved in that war and, and prosecuted that war also if any of you have taken the Vietnam War class here, or perhaps U.S. History too, or maybe you just know this, really to a large extent, the United States got involved in that war and fought that war at the behest of a series of presidents, with Congress either actively supporting the president or acquiescing until later in the war. So again, by 1973, Congress determined, we don't want to repeat this mistake. We want more oversight. We want more say before, or God forbid, we get involved in another Vietnam-type situation. Obviously, the war, the way the war turned out, which is to say it wasn't a victory, and arguably it was a defeat, had a lot to do with this resolution also. And then finally, clearly, the, the act was aimed, to some extent, specifically at Richard Nixon, and his handling of the war, and his handling of the presidency. To some extent, that is true. But we have to keep in mind this was a bipartisan piece of legislation that had support from both Democrats and Republicans, widespread support. <coughs> I was going to review the Vietnam conflict. I think Dr. Fierro has already done that really well. I mentioned you really can't understand the War Powers Resolution without understanding Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and the way that war played out. So 
So this resolution or act represent, representing an attempt to clarify and codify the respective military powers of two branches of government. On the one hand, the executive branch, and on the other hand, the legislative branch. To try to bring some clarity to that gray area. Not surprisingly, no president since Nixon has, has acknowledged this act as constitutional. Not one. And, and many of them have tried to evade it, avoid it, ignore it, get around it. So the question then becomes, how does Congress respond? We'll look at that briefly in a minute. So let me just give you the essential elements of the War Powers Resolution. Number one, the president must consult with Congress before American military forces are introduced into, a quote, hostilities or into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by the circumstances. So the president has to consult with Congress. He must continue these consultations for the duration of the intervention. Number two, unless Congress declares war, the president must report to Congress within 48 hours of U.S. military forces being um, introduced in the subject of war. He's got 48 hours. Number three, unless Congress declares war, the president may deploy U.S. military forces in a hostile situation for up to but no more than 60 calendar days. So kind of ironically, and I think this probably dovetails with Dr. Fierro's point, what the War Powers Resolution does is to some extent grant the President the power to wage war for two months. Not entirely, but pretty close to that. Now, it is true by passing a concurrent resolution of the House and the Senate, the Congress can call a halt to the operations before the 60-day period is up. But Congress has never done that. Number four, after the 60-day period has expired, the president must withdraw American military forces from a hostile situation unless Congress declares war or otherwise approves continuing the deployment. Congress may also authorize the president an additional 30-day grace period to allow for safe withdrawal of American military forces in the event they're locked in combat. Um, members of Congress realize if the 60th day gets here and American troops are fighting, we can't just expect them to leave in a day. We have to give the executive branch some leeway. So that's the guts of the, the War Powers Resolution. It's an attempt to require the executive branch certain more accountability, more consultation for the legislative branch, and to, to limit the president's power to wage war without congressional approval. The question then is, how, how well has this worked in the hours? Not so well. If the intent was to, to limit presidents getting involved in military actions, that certainly hasn't happened, one could argue. We've been involved in many, and Dr. Brown, uh, Professor Brown, could look at some of those, and actually some before 1973 as well. What tends to happen is, if the operation is sufficiently large, considered to be threatening to American national interests, there's, there's a rally around the flag on that. Members of Congress, or the majority of Congress, at least, invariably will pass some sort of resolution of support, such as the uh, Desert Shield Desert Storm back in 1991, such as the Iraq War. Happens again and again and again. Also, part of that, part of the reason for doing that is they are cognizant of their constituents. And, for the most part, the American public tends to be supportive of presidents intervening in the military, at least initially. That tends to be the history. On the other hand, there have been other military operations that have been so small and so quick and so um, short in duration that the War Powers Act was never invoked because Congress really didn't have, even have time to act. A good example of that would be the Grenada operation in 1983, very short in duration. So in a sense, it seems to be a Goldilocks measure. I don't know where that came in, but it, it's a Goldilocks measure. If an operation's too big and too important, it doesn't apply. If it's too small and too quick, it doesn't apply. But maybe it applies if it's somewhere in the middle. But again, it's rarely been invoked. And I think one 
the, the best way to assess it is, it's probably made presidents a little more cautious about getting involved without, without consulting Congress. But it certainly hasn't stopped presidents from essentially waging war without the full approval of Congress, and certainly without a declaration of war. Thank you. gives him responsibility for the conduct of the war. As Dr. Cohn pointed out, the War Powers Act was put in place in part to limit the president's ability to engage the nation in conflict without resorting to Congress. Now, I want to focus on a third aspect of the nation's military and constitutional history, the means by which the United States has conducted military operations without resort to a declaration of war or indeed, in many cases, without congressional action. Uh, first, a point that might seem so obvious that it goes overlooked, we have engaged some of the most vital and significant military engagements, military conflicts in the nation's history have been conducted entirely without a declaration of war. Um, no declaration of war launched the American Revolution. Simply because there was no United States of America in 1775 when the hostilities began. Second Continental Congress declared the United States to be an independent nation in 1776, but by that time, the war was already well underway. There was a virtual century, continuous sporadic warfare between the government of the United States and the various Native American nations. A cursory search through the literature on Native American conflicts that I did uh, a couple of days ago uncovers 58 separate conflicts with Native American nations that were described as war, all of which occurred without declaration of declaration. America's bloodiest war, the Civil War, between 1861 and 1865, took place without a declaration of war. The government of the United States and President Abraham Lincoln did not recognize the legitimacy of the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America, which was formed when the states of the South decided to leave the United States. The position of the United States government during the Civil War was that the conflict was an insurrection against the United States launched out of the South. Some 600,000 Americans, north and south, died in a war that was never declared. As Raphael pointed out, Dr. Uh, Dr. Piero pointed out, Congress came close in several of our more recent conflicts, after Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, to declaring war by voting to give the President an extraordinary and very vague amount of latitude to conduct action. In countless other cases, though, the President committed U.S. military forces to engagements that looked like a war, felt like a war, and sounded like a war, but wasn't a war. Uh, on at least three occasions in the 20th century, the United States engaged in conflicts under resolutions adopted by the United Nations. This has been a tactic that we use since World War II. Um, the first UN-based conflict was in Korea between 1950 and 1953. Forces from Communist North Korea invaded South Korea and nearly pushed both the South Korean Army and U.S. troops stationed in South Korea into the Sea of Japan. President Harry Truman saw consensus with Congress Want to refrain from conflict as part of the global struggle against com communism, so with the United Nations. A number of nations, Great Britain, the Philippines, Sweden, Turkey, Greece, others, sent troops, but the vast majority of the UN fighting force was American, and 33,500 of them died. The second um, occasion that occurs to me as significant, a second uh, occasion that strikes me as being particularly significant, was during the Balkan turmoil of the 1980s. In this case, the president was Bill Clinton, and except for 350 Americans who served as part of a peacekeeping force in Macedonia, American involvement was combined providing air support for UN peacekeepers. President George H.W. Bush, or if you want George I, uh, sought and received UN support for Operation Desert Storm. In this case, the president sought both approval by Congress and world support. He acted after Iraq under Saddam Hussein invaded his neighbor Kuwait. This action put approximately 40% of the world's known oil supplies under Saddam Hussein's control. It was perceived to be a threat to the world's economy. Several nations did contribute military support in a successful invasion that was spearheaded by U.S. troops and led by General, American General Norman Schwarzkopf, but was fought in the aegis of a resolution approved by the United, by the United Nations. 
while the United Nations has provided a venue for American military action without declaration of war in the post-World War II era, the fact is that American presidents, sometimes with support of Congress and sometimes unilaterally, have always been unwilling to commit American troops to combat without, have always been willing, excuse me, to commit American troops to combat without formally declaring war. The reasons why presidents commit American armed to conflict vary with time. In the early days of the nation, as the nation fought to preserve the rights of our mission, merchant ships to move freely on the oceans, our Navy engaged in several conflicts. There was an undeclared naval war with France called the Quasar War. Congress authorized this military action through a series of official resolutions between 1798 and 1800, but no declaration of war. Between 1801 and 1805, the Navy fought a series of battles in the Mediterranean Sea against the Kingdom of Tripoli after pirates there seized several American merchant ships. After an American warship was seized, Marines invaded several cities along the coast of Tripoli. Between 1806 and 1810, American ships engaged in combat with Spanish and French ships off the Mississippi Delta near New Orleans. In 1815, the Second Barbary War began when the government of Algiers declared war against the United States. The United States did not declare war against Algiers, the government of Algiers, but it did send a fleet to the Mediterranean Sea to attack Algiers. One other major reason for military action that occurred without a declaration of war, perhaps, the predominant one, is the protection of the nation's economic interests overseas. During the 1830s, over a century, during the 1830s, the United States sent troops into Argentina and Peru to protect the economic interests during times of revolution, revolution and insurrection. Marines landed in China during the 18, in the 1840s after a clash between Americans and Chinese at the trading post in Shanghai. In the 1850s, American Marines once again landed in Argentina to protect American interests against a revolution during a revolution in China and, and in Nicaragua during an insurgency there. And yes, the Marines once again landed in China in the 1850s. All told, during the 19th century, the United States landed troops dispatched the warships to Central and South America no less than 60 times. In some cases, the goal was to avenge slights against the United States. In most, however, there was an insurrection or revolution that seemed to threaten American holdings and interests. Many of these interventions were brief, the type decided by Dr. described by Dr. Cohn, but all carried with the potential for violence, and in many cases, actual conflict involving U.S. troops. Uh, I would suggest, something slightly off topic here, that the drumbeat of military Interventions elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere may help to explain the recurrent outbreaks of anti-American sentiment. Um, in the post-Vietnam War era, the nation's elite and perhaps the American people generally manifested what was called the Vietnam War Syndrome. The War Powers Revolution, described by Dr. Cohn, is one manifestation. The phrase describes the American retreat from an active role in rural affairs following the trauma of Vietnam. President Ronald Reagan, elected in 1980, wanted to reverse the syndrome. He believed that America's apparent withdrawal from the world encouraged the spread of both communism and terrorism. In 1982 and 83, dispatched Marines to Lebanon to help to maintain a gradual peace. Congress authorized the commitment in that case for up to 18 months. Under Reagan, the United States invaded the Caribbean island of Grenada, as Dr. Cohn described, because of the coup d'etat that brought power and allegedly pro-Castro, pro-Soviet government. In 1989, Reagan's successor, again, the first president Bush sent troops to Panama after its leader, General Manuel Moriega, chose to disregard the results of an election there. Uh, what are we going to make about all these commitments of troops about declarations of war? Um, most of all, I think there's an awareness among the presidents and Congress that not all military action requires a declaration of war. Troops can be committed, ships can be dispatched for short and specific involvements. A massive military intervention does require some type of congressional action, whether a declaration of war, the United Nations resolution, or a firm congressional resolution giving Congress the authority, give, for Congress giving authority for the President to do what the President deems necessary. The reality is that, well, there are times when a brief, decisive action is required quickly. That's what Dr. Vieira referred to when he said, Sometimes one person has to make the decision. And there's no time to wait for Congress to authorize, draft authorization, conduct a debate, and vote. Uh, we tacitly recognize that by not shouting and protesting when our troops are committed in those circumstances. I must confess, on a personal level, I have opposed or criticized many of the involvements of recent years, the invasion of Grenada, the 
the name of Operation Urgent Fury, seemed to me to be justified on the basis of major urgency nor fury by a president who wanted to shake the nation out of post Vietnam syndrome. The first Iraqi war under the first President Bush seemed to me to be entirely justified, and forgive me if I'm now lapsing into uh, naming wars after presidents. It's not my intention. The second Iraqi war, authorized by Congress under the second President Bush, seemed to me from the beginning to be foolish. An irrational approach, response to the attacks of September 11, especially since no one had really asserted and demonstrated that Saddam had a role in the attacks. On balance, though, I have to say that I understand the fundamental need to act quickly. If an intervention seems unlikely to be long-term and the circumstances seem to warrant urgency, then it seems to me to be only realistic to respond as quickly as possible without waiting for a formal declaration. The final and ultimate question, I guess, is whether it's unconstitutional to undertake military action without a declaration of war. As Dr. Fierro said, Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, states that the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, and the militia of the several states when called into actual service. The President is Commander-in-Chief because he has the responsibility for defending the nation. Article 1, Section 8 does give Congress the power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed by the high sea, and offenses against the laws of nations, declare war, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, provide and maintain a navy. It also gives Congress the authority to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. The meaning of those who drafted the Constitution can be guessed at to what they've written, what they wrote to each other, to what they published, but it strikes me that this is one of those cases in which the Constitution gives neither the Congress nor the President the sole power to act. It's the great genius of the Constitution. It gives great power in the description. Uh, it's a typical document, giving power to two branches of government, and basically allowing them to check one another or work together. Uh, so I have to say that the system, as it has worked over the past 225 years, is very much in the spirit of the Constitution. Whether it meets the letter of the Constitution, we have to leave up to the lawyers and the politicians themselves. Thank you very much. of being one of the oldest people in the room. So those of you that have read about the Vietnam War uh, didn't live through it as I did. And there may be one or two other people that do actively remember it. Now, at that particular time, you know, before Nixon even, America was sending help to support Vietnam. And I see you shaking your head because as history uh, experts, you, you understand that. Um, I'm going to recommend a book to a lot of people if you have, want to do some uh, interesting reading. Because as you said, many of these wars were, again, to protect the economic interests of the United States. However, it's within a narrow scope. Uh, and I, uh, the book that I wanted to recommend is called The Economic Hitman. And uh, it was written by um, the, um, one of the um, men that worked for NSA. NSA, I think it is. And um, they, they would be sent in. They were recruited right out of college and sent in uh, to go into these countries and really try to convince their dictators to economically support uh, the United States or their interests. And when that didn't happen, you know, he claimed they sent in the jackal. But it's a very interesting book to look at as far as the history. But my question to, to everyone here is that Congress can only be as effective as perhaps the information given to them. Now, I, when I look at uh, what happened with the Iraq War, uh, there were there were, were not a hundred percent of Congress that certainly approved that we should get involved. However, the information that was given, including uh, Powell, who, who had to appear before the United Nations 
to elicit their support was flawed. Uh, and, and therefore, I think that, you know, um, I think Congress does have the powers, but I think that there's other responsibility within the government because the people that the president uh, is associated with, the Secretary of Defense, his Vice President, all of those people um, are part of that. It's not just the president. And if the information that's given to Congress is not accurate, then I, I don't know that I feel Congress has total, uh, you know, I guess Dr. Ferrero, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, saying that Congress really is the one that declares war, but they can only make a decision based on the information they have. I think. Well, so can the president. And, yeah. you know, this is going to sound like a, a defense of George Bush. It's more of a repudiation of Congress. But the executive and the legislative branches, if they take time to read the information given to them, have access to the exact same information. The president is not necessarily privy to secret information that Congress doesn't have. And in fact, if you look at the run-up to the Iraq war, there was a lot of misinformation. As it turned out, Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. But there was not even a national, but an international consensus that he did. The French intelligence service thought he did as well. And so, yeah, Congress can only act upon what information it has, and so too can the president. So, you know, what I object to is for Congress to agree with the president in the initial stages of the war, to say that indeed Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction because they're looking at the same information he has, and then when the war becomes unpopular to shift in mid-gear and, and to say something completely different than what it had originally said. That, that's my objection. I wish that Congress would simply have the courage of its convictions and stick to its original ideas, or at least to say, you know what, we made a mistake, now it's time to shift courses. We're not funding this war because we have new information, so let's move on, let's, let's, uh, let's change our strategy. But what Congress ends up doing, typically, is to blame the president and dub it the president's war, when in reality, collectively, both branches made the decision to go to war. But the problem with Congress is that the elections occur so frequently, you know, that you have, a, you have different groups of people in there who come from, from perhaps entirely different, you know, viewpoints. And, and that's good in a way, because there's change, and, and there should be, but it also doesn't give that, that continuity. I mean, a president said right. four years, but you've right. got senators that are six years, but you've got the House of Representatives that a volatile, uh, dynamically changing group. That's a good point, and I, I do understand that. I, I guess my only thought on that would be, though, that I wish Congress also weren't so worried uh, as much about elections and just you know, keeping to what it originally thinks is right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I am um, sort of piggybacking a little bit and going back to Vietnam. I'm one of the other people in the room who remembers it, so. Um, yeah, and barely, uh, barely escaped the draft and having to go fight it. Um, but um, it's also true that, that Congress has been willing to be led by the president, and I think that that's, uh, that's so that's a lot on Congress. The, the, the branches of government are separate and equal. Um, and they're supposed to, in the process of negotiation, discussion, debate, compromise, work out their agreements. I would point out that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution uh, passed both houses of Congress. It passed the House of Representatives unanimously, 435 to nothing. And it passed the United States Senate, 98 to 2. So yeah, Congress was right there with Lyndon Johnson in 1964 when the escalation began. And um, it's not until considerably later. And, and as the war continues and becomes increasingly unpopular, you'll see senators begin to step away from their support for the conflict. And the senators basically, because the Foreign Relations Committee is where, and the Armed Services Committee is where the debates and discussions are held. But you can see senators like, uh, like William Fulbright from Arkansas moving away from the resolution without ever out and out repudiating it. Without ever saying, well, we made a mistake. But you know, sort of investigating the war on the pretext of investigating the context, the way the war is being fought, and I think that that the Congress um, Congress can has the ability to punt, and sometimes it does. 
So my question uh, has to do with this uh, recent Syria conflict. Now, I know that the president said he was willing to uh, you know, do a strike even though Congress may disapprove of it. Now my question is, has this ever happened before in history where Congress has, you know, just you know, disapproved uh, military action, and the president has, anyways, went ahead and done something about it. And also, what is American interest in Syria? Wants to take this. <laughs> yeah, those are good questions. I mean, the, this, the second question is what con is what Congress is debating, and really what the country is um, debating. What what are the interests in Syria? And what actions can we take there that will make things better there and protect our own interests and won't make things worse? In terms of presidents taking military action um, without congressional support, I mean, I'm thinking of Grenada again. I keep coming back to that. I don't even know if the president actually consulted the leaders of Congress. I don't think he did in that case. Um, so in, in a sense, you can say we don't know if there was congressional support because there was never a vote taken in Congress. And I'm sure there are other examples. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I don't know that most members of Congress knew where Grenada was actually right. when, when the <laughs> attack first happened. And it was so quick and so swift that uh, I don't know that there was time for deliberation, as Dr. Cohn said. And I can't think of another example of when Congress openly uh, rejected any any type of uh, military strike and the president going ahead and doing it anyway. Um, as far as America's interests in Syria are concerned, it depends on how you define interests. And, and this is also, it speaks to the power of the president. He can define interests very broadly. And so if our interests are to defend Israel, our ally in the Middle East, and Syria is a powder keg, which may spill over into surrounding countries, and Israel is one of them, then it's in our interest to go into Syria. Uh, we have other interests in the Middle East, having to do with oil, so there are economic reasons there, of course. Uh, we have political interests there. But if you define interest narrowly in terms of um, whether America, the American people will be harmed by the continued civil war in Syria, then, then the answer would have to be no. Of course, the president has the liberty to decide what America's interests are and how they are defined. Yes, it's um, interesting that um, after the disclosure that the Syrian government troops had, uh, had used sarin gas on uh, civilian population and rebel welfare, or in contested area, um, the initial instinct of the White House was to begin to prepare for a strike. And um, you know, several members of Congress, including uh, Christopher Murphy of Connecticut, uh, suggested, well, shouldn't Congress be consulted? And after a few days, a couple of days, um, the White House decided, yes, Congress should be consulted. And that's when you got the debate. Um, and uh, as far as the president explicitly violating the wishes of Congress as expressed in the congressional resolution, I can't recall any time when a president has ever done that. Um, as for our interest in Syria, yeah, we, we, we have interest in that region. Um, the immediate justification for an airstrike against Syria, uh, and I, if people had questions from the beginning about whether it would really achieve anything, uh, was to, um, for humanitarian reasons, to interdict the use of sarin gas in the future. Uh, also, indirectly, if you listen to some strategists, to send a message to Iraq regarding its nuclear program. If you, um, if if we were willing to um, have a strike Syria by air, uh, Syrian bases by air, because the the um, the, uh, uh, the regime uh, inflicted sarin gas on the people, uh, then the message can be clear to supposedly to Iraq's leadership, Iraq's serious ally, if you proceed with development of nuclear weapons, then the same thing could happen to you. Um, so I think that the justification, though, was the humanitarian one to punish Syria for 
uh, use of um, what was used in the foreign weapon of war. So, uh, somebody, okay. And I, I don't know if it's really a, a good a question, more just like a commentary. Um, the same way we're having this kind of a discussion, and you guys are making it more um, more knowledgeable as to what our specific interests are. Um, I think somehow, some way, that uh, as a as a community, as a nation, we all have a responsibility to make this knowledge available to the people that often sit back and. Um, watch the law take place, watch the changes, the events happen, and yet um, are, feel powerless to what's going on. When the UN, the UN specifically says that we're not supposed to engage with uh, chemical warfare on, on our people, that in, in, in its immediacy provoked uh, for President Obama to say, yeah, we're gonna take action, and, and he was rightfully so, but then other people you know, slammed him in the media for taking you know, such a vocal standpoint. I, I think it's uh, it's funny that we can play that whole bipartisan thing, and yet still we don't get anywhere, you know, as a people because we don't know what is and what isn't. I don't know, you know, how else to say that. But knowledge is power, and we are, you know, the people that can invoke the change that has to happen so that these things are shut down right now, and. Um, you know, future events that are affecting all of us, all of our wallets, all of our homes, and um, our, our little comfort zone, um, you have to get aware of it, or get ahead of it, so that you don't get hit by the train of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, tragedy. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dee. A um, couple points. First of all, this is being podcast, and those of you who are speaking are being captured on tape, so you'll be part of the presentation. It will be put up on the website sometime within the foreseeable future. And uh, Mike over here is, is, uh, is taking care of that. Um, uh, you mentioned bipartisanship. I do think one of the ironies of um, the debate around congr the, the congressional discussion around Syria is you did, to a certain extent, have a, an interesting reversal of roles, where Democrats were far more likely to support action in Syria than Republicans. Republicans were far more likely to oppose it, uh, and I think that this is a this is a, sort of a um, a lesson on the way in which Washington seems to be dominated these days by partisanship rather than bipartisanship. There were Republicans who um, who supported um, intervention. There are Democrats like Kristen Murphy who are clearly skeptical, but the the dividing line shifted. So I, I thought that was just the fascinating thing. Uh, the to observe here in the discussion of what to do. Uh, actually, I want to back up what uh, Doreen said over there in terms of the American public being as willing to advocate their responsibility as Congress, which kind of leads me to my next question. Do you folks see a correlation between these perpetual states of war now and the uh, abolition of the draft? And perhaps if the draft was reestablished, we might uh, be a lot less apt to get ourselves involved in these little foreign adventures. <laughs> Not so little sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, my gut says no. I, I, I'm not sure. I think if you look at the long history of the United States, regardless of whether there's a draft or not, it always seems to be that the, the United States is engaged in some conflict or another. Um, and so while in the short run it may make political leaders think twice. I don't know that a draft in the end will make the United States less of what it is. Um, it's a country that has more power than the next 20 countries combined. Military, let's Militarily, let's military. right. Its military is more powerful than the next 20 countries combined. And uh, when you are the strongest country in the world, your temptation is to engage in some sort of conflict or, you know, maybe in a more idealistic way to, to prevent conflict from escalating uh, in other parts of the world. I think it's not always that the United States is a bellicose nation wanting to engage in violence, although sometimes, I mean, the history of certain periods demonstrates that. Uh, I think we would do well as a country to, to 
uh, take into account that you know we may have the biggest hammer, but not every problem is a nail. That's not my metaphor. I like the metaphor, but a French foreign minister said that uh, in the run-up to the Iraq war. Uh, but when you are the most powerful country in the world, uh, your temptation, your knee-jerk reaction is to is to engage in some sort of conflict, regardless of whether there's a draft or not. Um, uh, what's interesting, though, is you know. The United States is one of three powerful civilizations that come to mind in, in world history. The Romans conquered everybody. Uh, the British in the 19th century waved the rules and ruled the waves. And now we have the United States. And compared to those other two, the United States is fairly tame in its attempt to influence other nations in comparative terms. So. I know while we look at ourselves under a microscope and we always seem to be at war, when we offer that comparative analysis, I don't know that the United States has been the imperialistic power uh, that others have been in history. You don't think we're just better at covering it up? No, I, I don't think if, if, if by covering it up you mean you know, we're spreading capitalism and it's, uh, it's much more furtive than you know, direct military in intervention, I suppose yes, but uh, our cultural spread is much more of, has had much more of an impact than our military conquest of other countries. I, well, and I, get, um, I, yeah, I, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't help but think of like what happened in Chile and what happened in Iran in the 1950s and whatnot. Sure. You know, sure. what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. that what we're going through now right. is a lot of blowback from those situations. In some sense, yes, but I, I don't think that the United States has acted in ways that other countries if they were in that position would have acted. Act, and nations tend to act in their own self-interest. And America perceives its self-interest to be, to be interventionist, especially after World War II. So that doesn't come as much of a surprise to me. I suppose what is a surprise is that the United States hasn't attempted to engage in direct conquest since, say, the beginning of the 20th century, the way European powers did, for instance. But there are, you know, as you point out rightly, there are situations that has caused the United States to be regarded uh, less than just. Um, you cited Iran in the 50s and Chile, uh, for instance. Yeah, absolutely, I can't disagree with that. And you do know, of course, there'll never be a draft again. It's, it's a moot point. Yeah, no, I, no, I understand yeah. that, but I, yeah. I, I, no, I. Although I support a draft for other reasons, quite frankly. I think it would be a, a wonderful civic exercise. Um, I, I really do. I think that's the reason to support a draft. And of course, we would have to draft females now, I assume, as well as males, into some sort of, if not the military, national service. I don't think that's a bad idea, actually. But I don't think it'll ever happen. I agree. I, I will say this. I think that um, the evolution of the draft during the 1960s, when it moved from being a mechanism whereby um, sons of poor families, sons of minority families, um, were actually the people who were mostly drafted. Over the course of the 1960s, it evolved into a system that was much more fair, in that all the deferments that uh, were available to students and were available to uh, farm, uh, fa heads of farm households and, and those various de exemptions, uh, they, they went away. And then, you know, in the end, what you did away, what you did, did away with the local draft board, and you went to a national lottery to determine who would be drafted. By the way, my draft number was three. Okay. Yeah, not one, not two, but three out of 365. Um, and I said I escaped. Uh, I escaped service by the skin of my teeth, uh, just because the, the calendar fell right for me. But uh, I think that you could trace, for instance, my father's awareness of an opposition to the war in Vietnam from the day my draft number was determined. And I think that one factor in turning public opinion against Vietnam, the war in Vietnam, was the fact that suddenly um, children of middle and upper class families could be drafted as well. I do think that it was responsible for changing the nation's attitude toward the war. Uh, I'm reminded also, to answer the gentleman's question over here, um, the um, statement of British Prime Minister, the great British Prime Minister, Britain, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, the end, in the late 19th century, he said to someone, England does not have friends, England has interests. And I think that that's true pretty much globally. We do have interests. 
and um, and sometimes we act to advance those interests in ways that are less than savory, and other times we're much more open about it. I will say this, the means of influence seems to me to, the tools available to exercise influence seem to me to have been broadened since World War II. I think that, yeah, there is, there is, um, um, there is an opportunity for more clandestine activities, the type that happened in Iran, Chile, Guatemala. Uh, I do think that, that that is something of a change, that the, the ways we can influence events in the world that is, uh, have, uh, have, have brought. A comment to that, it works both ways though. What we're seeing is the democratization of the dissemination of information. And so, you know, the Arab Spring, the revolutions in the Middle East and, and North Africa could not have happened without these changes in technology. So, uh, you know, I, historians don't make good predictors of the future, but I don't know that, I truly believe that Americans, America's authority will be challenged at every turn by nations because of uh, such uh, quick spread of information. And so a lot of the blowback that you're going to see against America's interests will probably be, be based on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so it's interesting to see how things will change. And WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks, right. So does Congress have If I understand the question correctly, does the Constitution state what justified reasons for going to war? The Constitution does not state that. That's simply left to the discretion of, of Congress and, and the President. Uh, Congress in its various resolutions, though, will offer usually a long list of reasons why. If you look at the Iraq War Resolution, uh, it goes on and on for a few pages. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was fairly short and straightforward. But usually it's Congress that lists the reasons why uh, America's going to war. And this is a tradition that stems all the way back to the American Revolution. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, George III is indicted on you know, 26 charges of what he's done to provoke the United States into war. Um, so in the Constitution itself, there's no such language but Congress does have that, that power to use language in its resolutions. Is um, the killing of Os uh, Osama bin Laden, where uh, you know its operation started and ended in a couple of hours? Um, would that be something that would uh, fall under the War Resolutions Act? Would that be, you know, it, it being over so quickly, not necessarily being in conflict? In and out, you know, that's that's that less than 60 days. Um, yeah. It happened in less than two days, so it had to consult with right. Congress. And if he had. Um, um, it would have been greeted with, I think, overwhelming support. But this is a sort of sort of micro-military micro operation that, uh, that I think sort of um, has resist beyond the pale of the larger um, scales of conflict, that, that, that operations like this have to be authorized uh, and kept private, kept quiet. Uh, and I think that, that no one really challenges the need for secrecy in a case like this. Um, and if it had failed, if he had not been there, um, it would have been a long time before we found out about it. So, uh, of course, um, if we found out about it because it worked and the president wanted to address the nation. Um, so yeah, I think that, um, that everybody recognizes that this sort of operation needs to um, exist in a world beyond large-scale considerations of military conflict. I, you know, in my presentation, I, I, I obviously made the point that Congress has the power to declare war and should act upon that. But clearly, there are cases in which it would be 
impractical to consult Congress and the, the operation against Osama bin Laden is a case in point. You know, even in smaller military scale operations, sometimes a declaration of war would not be feasible because it takes a lot of time for members of Congress to assemble and get together, not as long as it once did because of the quick spread of, of communications and all of that. But some operations simply, it would not be possible for Congress to deliberate and to discuss, and you need the president to act quickly. And that, was, that is a case in point. Uh, that it matters. Uh, actually, in terms of the overall, I, I, I was thinking about that before, just in terms of the overall history of what you guys have been discussing, I just, I, I couldn't help but notice some irony here, if I'm correct. But if what you're saying is true, then the last president to actually seek a declaration of war from Congress was the last president that actually could have gone ahead and declared war without the approval of Congress, and that would have been Franklin Roosevelt because an American territory was attacked yet he still sought the approval of Congress, and yet all these other presidents have not sought the approval of Congress when in fact there was no uh, threat to actual American right. territory? That's actually an interesting way of putting it. I never thought of, that, of it that way. Uh, he was in fact the last president to declare war, to get a declaration of war from Congress. That's true. And the circumstances under which he did so maybe didn't require that he get a declaration because America was in immediate danger attacked at Pearl Harbor. Uh, so I suppose there is some irony in the fact that he went ahead and got a declaration of war. Of course, it was unanimous because the nation was being attacked. One person. Except for Jeanette Rankin, that's right. Um, so that's quite good, actually. It's a, it is an interesting point. I wanted to just sort of add, because we do teach history here, um, one sort of ironic footnote. Um, we were talking, we were said, except for Jeanette Rankin. Jeanette Rankin was a congresswoman from Montana in 1941. She was a pacifist, and she opposed war. Uh, Jeanette Rankin is also the only person in the United States to vote against the two declarations of war in the 20th century. She was a congresswoman from Montana before um, the, um, uh, the suffrage amendment was approved. She was still a congresswoman from Montana, and she was a pacifist in 1917, and she voted against entry into World War I. She lost the election, her, her re-election bid, and uh, then she was a private citizen for several, uh, for several years, and then she was re-elected to Congress just in time to vote against entry into World War II, the only person to do so. She actually said, uh, uh, peace is a woman's job because men have a natural tendency to be labeled cowards if they oppose war. So that was her justification for voting against two world wars. Anybody else? We still have plenty of time. You said that, um, that there's never been a time where Congress, you know, wouldn't have supported or didn't support what you know the president was needing to do. Do you think we would have seen something different with the present situation that we're in? I mean, in some ways, because the Russians stepped in and suggested to the Syrians the whole issue around chemical, President Obama got to you know dodge a bullet. But with the the way that we're so um, fractionalized and you know on such different, what do you think? You know, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but just some idea of what you think might have occurred. I mean. Yeah, I mean, the Syrian issue, is, as you know, it's, it's extremely complex. Certainly it is a partisan issue to some extent, but as Professor Brown said, it seems to be the Democrats that were more supportive of actually Republicans more against, which is not typically the case. This is probably the only time I've agreed with Chris Murphy on anything, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, it's not really um, my cup of tea in many ways. But. I think what happened here is what should have happened, quite frankly. The president hesitated, and he did go to Congress, and he, he knew clearly that there was not congressional support to, to rush into military action, nor is there public support. So in that sense, I, I think the Constitution worked, even if it kind of 
informally or indirectly. We could still end up being involved in a military operation there. It could still happen at some point. We certainly hope not. But I think the question is, again, what would the goal be? What, what would we hope to accomplish exactly that wouldn't make things worse, both there and, and potentially for us? And, and that's the dilemma. And yet, if we do nothing, that's a dilemma, too. In reading um, the newspapers, the press accounts of what was happening in Washington, as the Congress was discussing without ever formally considering a resolution, and becoming clear that there was, you know, considerable skepticism about the policy that the president had initially proposed. Um, one of the things that you heard was, um, from time to time in the media, someone would quote an anonymous commentator, a source close to um, the issue, saying that uh, you know the president does not need to be bound by a congressional resolution. And I think that dropping that into the uh, sort of the pond, the riffles, uh, suggests that it's possible, I don't know how likely it is, but it's possible that there would have been those in the White House who advocated continuing even in the face of a congressional resolution. Uh, now whether Obama would have done that, you know, he's a pretty cautious guy. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think so. But it seems obvious to me that there were those in the White House who were at least contemplating what to do if Congress didn't support a resolution. And there were those who were saying, perhaps we'll go ahead anyway. Two over here. that I've always been curious about. Um, after September 11th, we were attacked, so, you know, innately we attacked back. Um, but once the reason for going to war changed from us being attacked to they have weapons of mass destruction, um, the fact that the United States didn't turn it into, didn't personally remove themselves and turn it into a UN issue, um, it insists to me that we have ulterior motives for being there because weapons of mass destruction have the power to affect the entire world and there's no guarantee that they would be used solely on us. So the fact that it wasn't turned into, um, I think what Professor Brown said, something that looks like a war but isn't really a war, um, concocted by the UN, um, it makes me believe that there were ulterior motives and I was just wondering what you guys think that those might be. Um, I know that a lot of people say that it's because of oil, but I've always had a hard time agreeing with that because to me it seems like it would be in the Middle East's best interest to sell us the oil because it's a means of interest of income for them. So I'm just curious as to what um, reasons there would be for staying there. Well if you if you read some of the more radical critics of the involvement, uh, you'll find all kinds of ulterior justifications. Um, and they echo well, Pat's uh, recommendation Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. Okay, um, uh, everything from um, um, it's good it, it's good business for private military contractors to it's good business for civilian military to civilian contractors who have to rebuild a destroyed nation. You know, you can go on and on through the list of reasons. Um, I prefer to believe that, in fact, and then if you follow that line of reasoning far enough back you'll come to a core belief among some people, a few, that actually the Bush administration allowed September 11th to happen. And I have a tough time with that. Um, which means I, I have a bit of a tough time with all of the stuff that follows from that. But I do think that there were a variety of motivations. I think that weapons of mass destruction uh, was one. I think that um, um, it was, um, on a psychological level, on, and perhaps on a political level with the, with the president, it was, a desire to seem to be doing something dramatic, something serious about what had happened. Uh, and I think that, that, that from my perspective, uh, the decision was a foolish one, to pick the wrong war at the wrong time. Uh, but I think that there was some perceived pressure to do something. And certainly Saddam Hussein was a good international bad man. Um, President Bush did attempt to win support from the rest of the world. Uh, he largely failed, uh, the, you know, the Germans, the French, 
uh, we're not willing to um, to um, go along. And that's when Congress stops, when the uh, cafeteria in Congress start, stopped uh, selling French fries and started selling freedom fries. Um, and, and I do think, though, that, that, that I think that in the, time, in the climate of the time, there was a perceived need to do something. And that's, that's sort of what I would argue. Well, there's seldom one reason why nations do anything. So it wouldn't be just for oil. I think oil is way down on the list personally. There are economic interests the United States has in that region, but if oil were the reason we attacked Iraq, then we should probably attack Canada first because we get more oil from Canada than in Iraq. So it's not just that. Um, but, you know, if you look at the Iraq War Resolution of 2002, there is language that refers to, to the UN Security Council. It says here, whereas the United States is determined to prosecute the war on terrorism, and Iraq's ongoing support for international terrorist groups combined with its developments of weapons of mass destruction. So it was assumed by Congress that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction in direct violation of its obligations under the 1991 ceasefire and other UN Security Council resolutions made clear that it is in the national security interests of the United States and in furtherance of the war on terrorism that all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions be enforced including through the use of force if necessary. So, I mean, you, I suppose a, a very strict interpretation of the resolution is that the United States was acting in accordance with a UN resolution of, you know, 20, you know, 10, 11 years before, um, if you look at the, the language strictly. So, uh, you know, did, did the United States get the support of uh, many nations to fight the Iraq war. No, you know, Professor Brown is right, and I think that was one of the failures of, of, of the Bush administration to prosecute the war. Uh, Not to belabor the point, but um, and clearly the president and, and the end the majority of Congress saw perceived national interest there. We had, Saddam Hussein had invaded and conquered Kuwait and threatened the world oil supply, and quite frankly, if that war, the second war, was just about oil, one could argue that oil is a vital U.S. interest. You know what happens every time the price of oil goes up, the price of gasoline goes up. Um, you know, it has an enormous economic impact. Um, not just this country, but really the whole world. So in real politic terms, the threat to the world oil supply, if it was perceived as such, is perhaps reason enough to intervene. Traveling microphones. <laughs> um, 20 years ago, we were involved with a um, UN operation in Somalia. Um, I was just curious to get your input on the uh, government's interaction, both legislative and uh, executive, on how they carried out with the um, with the act in 1973, and then also with other ongoing operations throughout the 90s with um, the UN and NATO. Actually, I think you go back a little bit more than 20. I think it's closer to 30. I think Somalia was the early 80s, 80 to 83. It was in 1993. It was 1993. Okay, that's right. That's right. Clinton was president. I'm sorry. That's right. Clinton was president. That's right. Um, first Bush, then Clinton. Uh, yeah, that was a, um, a humanitarian. Um, mission uh, undertaken under the aegis of the United Nations. And, you know, the United Nations does intervene not to promote conflict, but to prevent conflict. That's what it does. It doesn't send, uh, doesn't send uh, an army, it sends peacekeepers with uh, specifically defined goals. And uh, the United States deployment there, um, the specific incident that, that gets most of the attention is the, the, uh, the incident uh, described in Operation um, Black Rock Down, um, was designed to advance the cause of peacekeeping by um, taking out a, um, uh, a world war, and it, it failed miserably. Uh, one way that we have been able to deal with situations in which um, it's useful to do so 
is through uh, acting as part of the United Nations. If you'll remember in Operation Black Hawk, in, in Black Hawk, Black Hawk Down, the, the downing of the Black Hawk helicopter in Somalia, um, the, uh, the uh, troops who eventually came to the rescue of those um, Marines trapped, those Rangers trapped in the middle of uh, Mogadishu were Pakistani, and they were part of the peacekeeping expedition too. Uh, you know, the question of the relationship of the United States to the United Nations has always been politically fraught. Um, but we have participated in limited ways in um, peacekeeping operations. Mostly, I guess its most substantial commitment was in the, in the Balkans in the 1990s. And our um, support there was primarily in providing air cover for peacekeepers and protecting people on the ground. Um, but like I said, the, the, the involvement of the United States in UN peacekeeping efforts is, uh, is as controversial a subject as um, its involvement with the UN period. So. I think the Somalia incident just demonstrates to me that the United States has always attempted to carry out humanitarian uh, activities across the world, but those end as soon as America's interests are, are threatened. So the minute that a dead American soldier, uh, pictures of, of him blared across the globe, that's when the United States pulled out of that mission. And so, whether humanitarian or not, when the American public perceives that it's just not worth going in, then, then uh, the United States will back down. Uh, the legislative branch had very little to say about that. It was one of those quick missions that didn't, um, that Congress didn't have the time to discuss or deliberate. And, uh, you know, although there were deliberations on the conflict in the Balkans, it was a, 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 it was a NATO-led mission. And, you know, there's tension between what NATO's interests are and what uh, America's interests are. Um, and some would even say that historically, the, the power of Congress has been diminished by these international organizations that make decisions independent of what the Congress wants. Yeah, maybe one more. We've got about five minutes. If you have to leave, we understand. What, what would the founding fathers think of the United States' uh, involvement in the UN? George Washington would have been adamantly opposed. I don't think that he was very interested in the United States having any political alliances with other countries. Avoid entangling alliances, he said. Yeah. Most of them would be a little suspect. Thank you.